Hey friend, welcome back to Bible Tract Echoes. I'm Micah McCurry, your host. And I'm so thankful that you would take the time to join me once again today. I get to talk to the wife of one of my heroes. We'll be speaking today with Miss Judy Garris, and I got to interview her not long ago. We're going to listen to a snippet of that interview on Bible Tract Echoes. The Garrises were highly impactful in my in-laws, who, of course, in turn, impacted my life in multiple ways, not the least of which that I married my wife because of the Woodward's great job and, and godly biblical job in raising children. And now we have another generation, Emmy and Lucy, that we're trying to raise in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Brother Ron Garris, one of the founders of Rock of Ages Prison Ministry, was kind of a, another grandfather to my wife and her sisters. And Miss Garris is going to talk to us about how important it was that they, he was an evangelist later in life, how important it was for them to stay together as a family. And we're going to hear how God helped Mrs. Garris with that. I pray this is a blessing to you as you seek to follow God's will today. Listen in. I had mentioned he was very strict on having a verse of scripture. And when I knew that the Lord was leading about the prison work, I had always, you know, since we were saved, I had always kind of depended just on what the Lord gave him. But with going on the road, I felt like I needed a verse for myself, sure. because I wanted to stay together, and I didn't know how the Lord was going to do that and how he would make a way. So we fasted and prayed together, and the Lord, uh, I read the verse the Lord gave Ron, mm-hmm. but he gave me First Thessalonians 5.24, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Amen. Our son was going to be a junior in high school. How would we do his education? How would we travel? How would we stay together? And that was the verse the Lord assured assured me that it would all be taken care of. Amen. Now, forgive my ignorance, but I guess that's why I asked the questions. How, How many years, essentially, on the road did the Lord give you folks? Uh, we were, I think it was 10 or 11 years in the motor home, mm-hmm. and then the ministry began to expand so sure. that that was too slow. Uh, we began to travel in a car, yeah. and that became too slow. In the last probably five, six years, we flew wow. most everywhere. But we were together from uh, 1978 is when we started, and Ron went to heaven in 1970. 2006. Yeah. Yeah. I Speaking of that, my first introduction to your husband was not in person. Um, I had just started. I'd been coming to football camp for just a few years. We'll talk about the relationship with yeah. the Woodwards and all of that. But I got to watch him preach by this was this was before everything was by Zoom and teleconferencing and FaceTime and all that with the, all the communications we have to some degree and uh, I don't know if it was one of the last messages he ever preached but he was in a wheelchair and uh, preached a, a, a recorded message to us there at a football camp. Let's before we get to that, can we talk about your relationship with my in-laws? But using that as an example for your relationship with people that you met on the road. As an evangelist myself, you get to meet people. And Lord knits your hearts with some yes. people. And so talk to us about maybe using in a microcosm your relationship with the Woodwards, but how the Lord knit your heart with, hearts with some people and how you kind of adopted these girls and all that type of stuff as well. How the Lord do that for you? I don't know. There's Like you said, there are just certain families. I mean, as you travel, you'd love everyone. Sure. And they're all special. But there are just some that somehow the Lord knits your heart in a special way. I don't remember exactly how we began coming here. I know we'd come. Brother Woodward would uh, started to have him ask him to come mm. for revival every year. And it was always like the week Thanksgiving week. Uh, With us being on the road, usually rather than fly home for a day or two and then, you know, back out, it was Ron asked Brother Woodward if it would be possible 
for us just to come here and, you know, stay a week before the the Thanksgiving revival. Mm -hmm. And we just became family. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Um, And so that would have been approximately, if you had to guess, what what time frame would that have been? I think... I don't, Ruth Ann was not even born okay. yet. Okay, sure. And so my my father in law has been pastoring for thirty eight years. So that would have been if she wasn't born. I mean, somewhere around thirty. We'll just say mm-hmm. about thirty years ago. So it would have been early in Pastor Woodward's yes. tenure. And so that also would have been right around the time that football camp began to because it's been around for thirty years itself. Yes. So it would have been in its infancy to some degree there. And um, Talk about your husband, and may, may, again, maybe using Pastor Dan Woodward as as an example, but talk about your husband's relationship with men. I have a sneaking suspicion that he had a desire to invest in and grow, obviously, working with a prison ministry that's part and parcel of what he did, but the opportunities he had with pastors and men that he met along the way. What was it about him that wanted to invest and impact the next generation? He, he just loved people. He loved people. Amen. I really don't know, Brother Mike, sure. how you yeah. know how to explain. He he just loved people and loved seeing what the Lord would do in their lives, and and uh, had a desire to be a friend. Mm. And uh, he had it was sometimes I'd say to me it would be sometimes scary the insight that the Lord would give him in preaching with revivals, it seemed like the Holy Spirit would always put a finger on an issue or something that was needed in the church or that was a concern of the pastor. And most church people and and a lot of pastors that were not involved in that particular meeting would think that the pastor, yeah, our preacher's been alone with with Brother Ron and told him all our sins and and you know uh, what to preach on. Sure. But he didn't. He didn't like pastors telling him what the problem was or what was needed. He just wanted the Holy Spirit too. And uh, sometimes it would be, like I say, it would be almost scary. <laughs> you know how close. Sure. Uh, the Lord would lead him with dealing with things that were necessary in that church. Absolutely. Now, as the prison ministry grew and God gave kind of an abundance and all those types of things, how how did the Lord grow him in those things? Because what was his official title for them? I mean, kind of founder, director, president, or what uh, would that be? Well, he was, he and the evangelist mm-hmm. kind of, put the the ministry together of course the evangelist was able to uh had the ability to derate the finances right had the exposure with with churches and pastors and we just came on as a missionary sure but as the the ministry grew uh the evangelist that was actually took over you know Mm -hmm. the president Mm -hmm. position Mm -hmm. Uh, had bad health and had to step down, and they've uh, appointed Ron as the president. But uh, during that time, the Lord burdened him about uh, inmates needed to be discipled. So we began a discipleship program of Bible studies for them. Another pastor that we knew surrendered to the to the prison work. And he wrote uh, Bible lessons, not just on the books of the Bible, but also on Mm character-type studies. One time we were in Mississippi and the prison revival, a school principal approached him about coming to the school and having some type of program with the children, and that finally uh, developed into a youth ministry along with in schools. We have a program for uh, school children, high school through, you know, grade school through high school, and uh, in the youth prisons. 
And the Lord just, it just seemed like whatever area people would find out that they were doing something, they would see was it possible for us to, to do something in, in their particular area. Amen. There's probably a lot of adjectives, fireball. I mean, there, there, there's all, all <laughs> yes. sorts of. I I, I uh, watched uh, just a few a few clips of him preaching, and uh, it just yes, enjoyable, but certainly convicting. <laughs> and as you said, spirit led. What are maybe some recollections you have of just some of the the stories that people might recall or things that make you that, the reasons you're chuckling right now? Well, he always called me wifey. Okay. And I told him that was because he couldn't remember my name. <laughs> he didn't want to get me mixed up with an old girlfriend. But, uh, uh, of course, he was famous for look, being my God-given eyeball. Mm-hmm. Um, he was famous for, uh, if you didn't like it, come out, you know, uh, him meet you out back and back over you with his car. Uh-huh. Uh, but... Uh, some you either loved him or you hated him. <laughs> there was, there was not a lot of in between. With it seemed like with people. I understand. But uh, he was that was just him, and he didn't care whether you liked it or not. <laughs> well, you, you talked about him being all in, regardless of what he was doing. And yeah. it sounds like preaching, he was all in on that as yes. well. Uh, on an average basis, how many? How many times a week in those those hot and heavy years? How many how many times a week was he preaching as uh, the norm? We usually tried to go home uh, every quarter because okay. of the board meeting. We sure. had board meetings, but other than that, uh, maybe for a day or two, mm. we never unpacked a suitcase after we got out of the motor home. I'd just go home and stay up all night. <laughs> Take the dirty clothes out, wash them, put them back in. What a whirlwind life. I think back to the busy days of evangelism for the McCurry family, and I can identify a little bit with that. There have been so many whose lives have been impacted by these dear people. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to tune in tomorrow as we continue this discussion with Mrs. Garris, I so appreciate your listenership. My prayer, as always, is simply this, that you have a great day for His glory, and we'll continue this interview tomorrow. God bless. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Track Echoes, a ministry of Bible Tracks Incorporated. If you would like to receive a free sample booklet of all of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. That's 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is P.O. Box 130, Dwight, Illinois, 60420. A faster way to contact us is to go to our website at BibleTracksInc.org. That's BibleTracksInc.org. There you will find more information about our ministry and details on how you can support Bible Tracks Incorporated. Thanks for listening, and may the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.